you've been with us, we've been in a series called The Blessed Life. And you think about it, all of us really want to have a blessed life. Well, today is the closing message to that. If you've missed any of these along the line, you can go online. You can watch all of the messages free of charge. But today we're going to kind of wrap up this series. And we again recognize that the blessed life, this was God's, it was his intention, it is his intention, and remains his intention for every single one of us. That's God's desire that every individual here today experience for themselves truly a blessed life. And so we've been studying the principles behind all that. We realized that number one, the key to the blessed life is what? Anybody been listening? It's generosity, yes. Generosity unlocks that and unleashes that reality into our midst. We also recognize that it's a work of grace. It's something that God does in us that we yield to in that regard. And our outlook, how we see our outlook affects our outcome. That when grace is working in our hearts, generosity is not something we got to do. It's something we get to do. It's a privilege. It's an opportunity. And then we learned last week that generosity is the test of our sincerity for our love for God. How do we know that our love for God is growing. It's as our generosity grows because God's love is generous and the more it grows inside of us, the more generous we are as people. And so, as we've learned through the course of this series, that generosity is an invitation from God to us to be able to experience life as he lives it. But it's also our invitation to God to allow him to work in the midst of our circumstances. Because everywhere we invite him in, everywhere we allow generosity to be displayed through our lives is a chance to see God work in, me, in ways beyond what our minds can imagine that only he can do. And so today, we're gonna talk about where the inspiration for generosity comes. What's the source behind it? Because no matter what, no matter where people display generosity, whether they realize it or not, generosity begins with God. God is generous. Our generosity is in truth a response to his generosity. No matter how we do that, no matter which way in any essence, our generosity is always a response to God's. Now, Jesus told a story, a parable. A parable is simply a story that makes a point. It's an illustration that emphasizes a point. Jesus told this story. It's found in Matthew 20, but listen to me for a moment. Jesus said, the kingdom of God is like this. It's like an owner of a vineyard who went out early in the morning to find laborers to work in his vineyard. And he found at 6 a.m. those that were gathered looking for work, and he made the deal with them. He struck the deal and said, I'll pay you this much to go and work in my vineyard today. So they went out into work, and so the owner of the vineyard went out again at 9 a.m. in the morning and found others that were there and said, go and work in my vineyard and I will pay you what is right. And then he went out also at noon and at 3 p.m. in the afternoon, finding others there, did the same, sent them out to work in his vineyard and told them in the end he would pay him what was right. And then at 5 p.m., one hour before closing time, he went out and found some that were still out there and he said, why are you here? Why haven't you worked all day? They said, no one hired us. No one gave us the opportunity. He said, well, go and work in my vineyard and I will pay you what is right. So when closing day came, the owner of the vineyard got his foreman to go out and pay everybody for their day's work. And he the, it started with the last ones, the ones that were hired at 5 p.m. And so he paid them what the agreed amount was for the whole day's work and he gave them. So all the guys who had been hired at 6 a.m. in the morning, they were figuring, wow, if those that were only working here an hour got a day's wage, then we're going to get so much more than that. But when all was said and done, when everybody was paid, they all got a day's wage. Now, the ones that had been working all day thought that that was unfair. You ever have that happen in your household? Your kids go, that's not fair. They got a bigger piece than me. They got to ride in the front seat last time. That's not fair. And here's the point. Jesus says through the story, the owner of the vineyard looks at them and said, did I give you what we agreed to? Yeah. But it's not fair that those, he said, listen, is it not my money to do with as I wish? Isn't that my prerogative? And here's the point of the story that many people miss. Jesus says this. 
He said, the owner said to them, are you envious because of my generosity? See, you and I must recognize God is generous. God is love and love is generous in every respect. But people, we have this sense of fairness, okay? But let me help you with something right up, right up front. God is not fair. He's like, shock you. No, God is not fair as we as human beings count fairness. God is not fair at all because God has never given any of us what we deserve. God has never dealt with humanity, giving us what we deserve. God has always provided grace. God has always shown his kindness. That everything in here, essence wise, we need to realize that everything that God has done in our lives is because of his grace, because of his generosity, and never because of what we've earned. But sometimes you can sit around, sometimes you can be a part of it. And and do you remember the story that Jesus told about two brothers that were the father, the younger brother went to the father and said, hey, give me my share of the inheritance. And the father gave it to him and he went out and he spent it by wild living. And then he came home, broke, you know, dejected, you know, kind of wasted his life and all that. And the father embraced him. The father loved him. The father restored him and had a big party. Remember that? But then the brother in the field who had been home the whole time, he was like, that's not fair. And he went and the father came out and begged him. He said, shouldn't we celebrate your, your brothers come home? He said, I've been with you all these years. And you've never done, see, he had an entitlement mentality. He had this idea that somehow he deserved. And what the father say to him? The father said, all that I have is yours. So often when we, can, when we can start to think back into that idea that why are you doing that for them? And we start becoming this, self-absorbed, that we miss the point that it's all about everything we have in life. Is about God's generosity. That's what Jesus was making the point of in his story. That's what the theme of the Bible emphasizes for us, that God, everything God has done is because of his generosity. His love is what inspires his generosity. In fact, if you're taking notes this morning, I don't have a TV, so I'm just gonna, I'm gonna use my iPad if you don't mind, okay? But you follow along with me in the notes. If you're taking notes, this me. Generosity begins with God. It always begins with God. Think about the earth that we live in. Think about creation as God made it. Everything that God has ever done has been the display of his generosity. Think about the systems that are in the earth. God made the earth to multiply. Think about the laws of like seed time and harvest, right? The Bible teaches us this, and we know this from nature, not just the Bible, but the Bible said while the earth remains seed time and harvest. We know this, when you sow one seed, Four months later, you don't get one seed back. You get what? A multiplicity. You know, God said to man, be fruitful and multiply. God made the earth systems to multiply. And guess what? They work the same for everybody. God made the earth the opportunities to grow and to multiply. And listen, every one of us who are here, everyone who are on the earth, we come to this, hopefully we come to this realization that we didn't bring anything into this world. And no matter what we think we own, no matter what we think we possess, do you know what the truth is? Someday, somebody else will possess it. We actually own nothing. But God freely gave what he created to mankind. God freely gave the resources and access to all that's here, and it works for everyone. It's God's grace provided all that we have. It's God's, and and Jesus even taught us that God's love is to both the just and to the unjust because he causes the sun to rise and the rain to fall, Jesus said, to the just and to the unjust. Why? God shows his goodness to all humanity because God is good. He is love and therefore his natural inclination. Generosity, listen to me. Generosity is to love like thunder is to lightning. Let me say that again. Generosity is to love like thunder is to lightning. Why? Because whenever you hear thunder, you know thunder is the result of lightning. Thunder doesn't exist without lightning. Thunder is always the result of lightning. And generosity is to love what thunder is to lightning. Why? Because people can give without loving, right? Can we give without loving? 
probably all of us here at some point along the way, we've all done that, right? We've all given without love because we give for various reasons. Sometimes people give to impress others. Sometimes people give to get, where they're giving, but they're thinking about what they're getting in return, okay? And sometimes people give just to get somebody off their back, right? We've all given for reasons other than love. But listen, you can give without love, but you can't love without giving. Because generosity is to love what thunder is to lightning. It's the natural display. And because God is love, God gives freely. He gives lavishly all that God has done for each and every one of us. Really, in honesty, none of us have ever deserved any of it. God gave it freely because of his love. So if you're taking notes, listen, we need to recognize it all began with God. And there's, here, before we go to the next point, let me, let me illustrate through this. Here's the text scripture. If you have your Bible, turn to 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter eight. Before we get there, I wanna read one other one to you. I put it in your notes, but in James chapter one and verse 17, it reminds us of this. All generous giving and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or the slightest hint of change. In other words, God doesn't change. Everything that a human being experiences in this life is a gift of God's generosity and love, whether we appreciate and respect it for that or not. And you may not have everything that somebody else has, but I'm gonna tell you what, even we who live here in America, I could take you to places around this world where you would be overwhelmed with generosity and love over what God, what you would get a chance to experience here versus where people are at even in other places. See, God shows mercy and grace by all that is in the earth. But here's the scripture in, in 2 Corinthians chapter eight. Now remember here, Paul had been, in, been working with the Corinthian church to fulfill what they began. They had heard that there was a need because in Judea, the birthplace of where the church had started in Jerusalem and the Judean area, that there had fallen upon hard times. The Christians who were back there, because of the uh, uh, overpopulation, because of the lack of good jobs, because of persecution that had broken out, both among the Jews and the Roman Empire, the conditions were so desperate, the conditions were so bad, that now the inspiration of God was to have these Gentile churches take up a collection and send it back to their brothers and sisters who were back in the Judean area. And so Paul had gone out spreading this message. The Corinthians had originally said, yes, we're gonna get on board. Yes, we wanna do something because Corinth was a wealthy city. But now the time was coming when the collection was about to be done and they weren't following through. And Paul's writing and inspiring them, hey guys, and he tells them about the Macedonian churches. We studied it. But then he goes back and reminds them. And here's the scripture. This is the text for today. In 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 9, he said, you know, he's about to remind them of something that they all already know, but sometimes forget. He said, you know the generous grace of our Lord Jesus. Though he was rich, yet for your sakes, he became poor so that you by his poverty could be made rich. In other words, guys, he reminds us of this because, because of Jesus, all that we have is because of his grace, not because of what we deserved. Do you know the easiest way to stop being generous as an individual is to forget what God did for you? The easiest way to be generous is to remember God's generosity. Did God freely and abundantly provided all that we ever needed in life, that through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, in other words, Jesus willingly chose to step out of heaven and lay all of it, I mean, think about this, he was God, but yet he was willing to become human. You talk about poverty, being willing to subject himself to being, having to need to be taken care of by others. Jesus, the vulnerability of being a baby, of having to depend upon his parents and the others to feed him and to care for him. See, he through, we through his poverty benefited as the result that because of his willingness to subject himself to being human, to in every way becoming what we are, experiencing life as we experience it, but more than that, 
that even made in the likeness of a man, he willingly went to the cross and paid the price that none of us could pay. See, all that we became was because of the overwhelming generosity of God displayed for us through Jesus Christ. That Jesus, all that we have is the result of what he did, not what we earned, not what we are, are, are entitled to, but because of the abundance of his grace. He's inspiring these believers again to recognize, hey, listen, don't forget what Jesus did for you. When you remember that, it's easy to be generous. It's that way in every area because listen, when it's difficult for you to forgive someone else, do you know what that's an indication of? You have forgotten that you have been forgiven. You have forgotten the overwhelming generosity of all that God made ours, that we can be forgiven again and again and again and again, no matter how many times we've affronted God, no matter how many times we have not followed through on our commitments, no matter how many times that we've sinned again, even we knew when it was wrong and have already been recipients of grace, that God hasn't stopped forgiving us. God is abundant and generous on that end. But you see, when you forget what you've been, forgot, what you've been forgiven of, then it's hard for you to forgive others. But when your heart is reminded of how much God's done for you, then it's easy to forgive other people because you give freely I have received, freely I can give. See, it's that way with everything in life. It's that way with grace. See, when you recognize how gracious God has been to you, then it's easy to be gracious to other people because grace is about giving people what they don't deserve. And the next time you're tempted, and I say tempted, you're tempted to get ticked off at somebody who's not giving you good service. When you're tempted to get angry about the person that cut you off. When you're tempted to get upset because somebody didn't meet your expectations. When you remember how many times we haven't met God's expectations. When we think of the great grace of God, you can say, go right ahead. I'll give you a five finger wave, not one. Here's the deal, you and I need to realize that God Almighty has been gracious and when he's been gracious to us, we can be gracious to us. Think about, when you remember how kind God is to you, then you can be kind to somebody else. See, the inspiration for generosity truly is God because listen, if you're taking notes, follow with me, follow. Generosity is the expression of God's love providing all we need. Generosity is the expression of God's love providing for all that we need. See, the thing you can, be, you can count on, the thing you can be absolutely assured of is this. God will always provide faithfully everything that we need. But let me clarify for some, okay? But he doesn't necessarily provide for everything you want. And there's a difference that way. Why? Because God is the ultimate father. He loves us. Because what happens as a parent, what happens if you give your kids everything they want? What will you raise? A spoiled brat, right? Who wants to be around? Self-absorbed people who feel entitled to everything, who think more about what they don't have than all of the abundance of what they do have. Nobody appreciates them because they're not grateful for anything they got. They're always thinking about what they want. And God ultimately loves us so much that he provides for everything that we need, but not necessarily always everything that we Want, because he always has our best interest at heart. It's like the man who was walking one day, taking a walk in the woods, and he was thinking about some of the greater mysteries of life. He was going through this end, and he said, God, can I talk to you about something? The Lord said, sure, what is it you will have on your mind? He said, well, I've been thinking about some things. Can I ask you some questions? The Lord said, sure. He said, well, Lord, I've been thinking about this. How long is a million years to you? And God says to him, a million years to me is but a second. He thought about that. He says, wow. He said, well, how much is a million dollars to you? And God said to him, a million dollars to me is like a penny. So the man thought for a minute. He said, Lord, one more question for you. Can I have a million dollars? And God said, sure, in a second. Here's the deal. You, <laughs> you and I can recognize that God is abundantly provision. God takes care of it. In fact, Jesus told us this story. He said, listen, whenever you're tempted to worry whether or not God will meet your needs, all you need to do is go to the window and find a bird. 
Look out your window and look around for a bird. Because he said, birds have never had a support group about how they're not, you know, about worry about their next meal coming. Birds have never needed counsel or therapy or any social services in society, all freaked out going, if government does this, I won't have that. They have never wondered about where their next meal is coming. And he said, they don't sow, nor reap, nor gather into barns. But what? Your heavenly father feeds them. And Jesus said, there's not a sparrow that falls to the ground that God doesn't know about. And he said, are you not much better than that? Now, I, you know, this is how my mind thinks. Let's think about it in this respect. I said, how much does it cost to feed the birds for a year? So I did my research, okay? On the ASPCA website, they said, if you're you know, thinking about having a pet, they had all these different things, what it costs to have a pet. And to have a small bird, what they average, the cost to feed a bird for a year is $75 what the ASPCA says, $75. So whether you realize this or not, I did the research on it, okay? There's approximately, and nobody can tell exactly, but there's approximately 600 billion birds on this planet. So what would it cost to feed them for a year? Now to all you math whizzes, you already got the answer, but here, let me tell you what it is for the rest of us. It's $4.5 trillion a year to feed the birds. $4.5 trillion. And my mind kind of, kind of escalates on this front, just how I am, okay? I said, well, 6,000 years of human history, how long would it have taken, how much would it cost to feed the birds for the 6,000 years of human history? Well, if you take that over 6,000 years, 4.5 trillion over 6,000 years, here's the answer. It's 27 quadrillion. There's not even that much money in the world, okay? And now think about that, that's only the birds. What about all the rest of the animals? If your father, okay, has access to 4.5 trillion a year just to take care of the birds, why would you think your situations that you are struggling with are a big deal to God? But we freak out. We go, oh my God, is there gonna be enough? Here's the question I've been asking through the course of this series. Is God trustworthy? Is God who he says he is? Will God do what he's promised to do. So we have to ask ourselves the question because the number one reason that causes us not to be generous is fear. We're afraid that I won't have enough. But the question is bigger than that. Is God big enough to meet your need? Is God overwhelmingly enough to deal with your life and bless your needs but give you so much that not only are all your needs met, but that you can meet the needs of others. That's the blessed life. It's a life, the blessed life as we've learned is having supernatural power working on your behalf. It's where everything you touch prospers and God has invited every one of us to experience it. So if you're ever freaked out on that front, God says, just take a look at a bird. Just look at what it is. Because God, here's the deal. God met our need, the greatest need that we have, See, the thing that you don't, you say, well, right now you're tempted to believe your greatest need may be the bill you have to pay, the sickness that someone in your family is dealing with, or all the rest. But do you know what our ultimate greatest need was? The, the need that every human being has. God took the responsibility to pay something that none of us had the ability to pay for ourselves. And what is that? It's the problem of our sin, okay? Our salvation how much did it cost God? And why did God save us? Ephesians 2, 4 says, but God, who is rich in mercy, with his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses and sins, caused us to be seated together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, by grace, you are saved. God paid the biggest need for all human beings. He settled the score for every one of us and provided salvation because why? I ask myself the question, what does a human soul cost? Because here's what the proposal Jesus said. He said, what would it profit a man if he were to gain the whole world and, you, and yet lose his soul? So here's what heaven, because it always amazes me, because God is abundantly provided to every single human being. God does not discriminate. 
black, red, white, you name it. Jesus died for the whole world. Young, old, you, whatever situation, socioeconomic, you name it. Every single human being, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. That whosoever, the abundant provision of God. Why is God so good to everyone in the world? Because God knows this. See, people think, well, what causes people to change? It's fear. No, fear changes people externally, but it causes rebellion internally. You give outward compliance, but never usually. And the Bible says it's the goodness of God that leads people to change. You know as well as I do when you've been shown mercy and you know you don't deserve it. When you've been shown grace and you have... You're overwhelmed because you don't know. And when that's what the hope of God is, is that somehow, some way, we'd wake up to this realization that God's goodness has been there every day for every human. And that's why the people who say to God, you're unfair, imagine this with me for a moment. That when, if somebody leaves this planet without ever partaking of what God freely gave to humanity, see, because he doesn't force his will, love doesn't do that. Love gives you choice. Love always provides opportunity, but it doesn't force its will upon any because that wouldn't be love. Love is free. Love is generous. And so if a human being leaves this planet without partaking of the grace that God provided for their salvation, imagine this, if they were to stand in the throne room of God and say, you're unfair because the one they'll be standing for at that moment will be responsible for judging their lives. And they say, well, you're unfair. Will be the one that will stand up, remove his robe, show them his back and the scars that were there, and then stretch forth his hands and show the, the holes that you can see light through and say, what more could I have done? See, the generosity of God is overwhelming, but we must... Understand that it comes to us freely, not because we've ever earned it. Everything that God has done has been because of his love. He's provided all that we need. And he goes beyond that. Because in Titus, it says God has generously poured out his spirit upon us as well. It would be great enough if all that God had done was pay the cost of our sin. But you see, Jesus, through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus so unselfishly loved us that we became what? Heirs of God and join heirs. In other words, everything in creation, Jesus was heir to, but he was willing to freely share that with every one of us. So that all that God has provided for us, I, I think like this, I've told this story before, and it, but it, I, it bears repetition because I've never found a better one to illustrate it. It's like this. It's like this, during the time in American history when people would immigrate from Europe across great steam boats that would come across the ocean, the Atlantic. It's a story I heard years ago that this little Italian immigrant man decided he wanted to come to America to live. So he saved all of his money diligently for a year. And he bought the passage on that steamer to come to America. But he realized that he didn't have enough money for food. So he gathered up cheese and crackers and things that would last the journey across the Atlantic. And he put it all together. And so when he was on the boat, he would come out of his, his, his room and he would sit down on the deck when all the passengers on the boat were in eating and faring sumptuously for the food that was served to all the guests in the, in the dining hall. But he would sit out and look through the window and eat his little cheese and eat his crackers and other things, kind of longing, wishing he could be there. And as the boat was getting ready to, to, to come into dock in New York, the chief steward, the guy who was responsible for all the guests, came to the man and said, excuse me, sir. He said, have I done something to offend you? Have I done something to hurt you? And the man said to him, no, why would you think that? No, 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 you've been more than kind. You've been gracious the entire journey. He said, well, sir, there must be something I've done because you have never came to, to any of the meals that were served here on the boat. And the man was embarrassed and kind of ashamed. He said, well, I'm so sorry. It took me everything to pay for the passage to get across the Atlantic. I had no more money left for food. And the steward looked at him and said, but sir, all of that was included in your ticket. You already paid for that in your fare. And I think of that because it so describes us as Christians that as much as we've experienced the grace and the goodness of God, 
We have no idea at the fullness and the riches of what God's made ours in Christ. That God has done so many more things for us than we've even begun to imagine or think. The great generosity of God deals with our health, deals with our relationships, deals with every facet of our life. God wants us to live the blessed life, which is blessed entirely in every facet because why? God has blessed us with all spiritual blessings. Everything we could ever need, everything anything we could ever desire. God, we have access to not just to better our lives, but when we have that realization that God brings his blessing to us so that it can flow through us, we haven't even begun to scratch the surface of the greatness of God and the abundance of his generosity that if we were to begin to live life as God lives it, we would find an ever flowing stream that never runs dry. God is generous. God is willing. God, God, listen to me. God is never your problem. No matter what situation you deal with, no matter what condition you're in, God is never your problem. God is your answer. All you need is trust. All you need is to come to know him better, that your boldness, your confidence, because why? As James said it this way, if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. Because why? Because God meets it out, you know, skimpy? No, generously, God abundantly provides it. But let him ask in faith. See, until your heart trusts, till you come to that realization, everything God has done for you has been the outreach of his love. God is love. So generosity and love go hand in hand. God is abundant. God is able and willing to do everything we've ever needed him to do. So let's talk as we close today. Listen, listen. As we close, let me talk about the generosity of God for a moment. If you're taking notes with me, listen. As I thought about the generosity of God, three things describe that to me. Number one, it's free. It's free. In other words, it's not any, it doesn't cost you anything. God's generosity is free. In other words, nothing that God has ever done in our lives did we earn, did we deserve, in fact, that's insulting to God to think that somehow, some way, you can actually earn your fav his favor. No, God does everything in our lives by grace. God does everything in our lives out of the abundance of his generosity. It's an insult to him for you to try to think in some way, shape, or form that you deserved what God did. But listen to the scripture. I love this. One of my favorites. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 32, it says, He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all. Now, when did God do that? The Bible tells us God demonstrated his love for us when we were yet sinners. Christ died for the who? The ungodly. Do you know what? That generosity never benefits you till you realize you're bankrupt. That's the problem with religion. People are trying to earn it. And what they find out at the end of the road is that you can't. A gift is free. It comes without strings attached. As long as you're trying to earn it, what you do is preclude yourself from participating in what God freely, abundantly, and generously provided for you. And that's a sad reality if people don't. But here, it's free. It costs you nothing. But God, who did not spare his own son, what did it cost God for your salvation? What did it cost God to provide an abundance of generosity to you? It cost God everything. And he thought it was the best investment he had ever made because God loves you and I. That's what caused Jesus to die. That's what God had provided. If God did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also? See here, every time you've ever questioned, God, will you? God, do you care? All you need to do is think back to the cross because if God did not spare his own son, but gave him up for all of us. How shall he not with him graciously give you all things? Freely give you all things, depending on what translation you're reading. See, God through Christ provides everything that we need, but often what gets in the way is when we start to work for it, when we start to try to earn it, then we short circuit the system. But when we trust, when we believe, when we say, Father, you have provided all things richly, God said, it is my joy. It's, here's how Jesus said it. Do not fear, little flock. It's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. God has provided richly all things that we need. It's free. Don't cost you anything. Number two, generosity. It's unconditional. 
In other words, it's offered to everyone. Listen to this scripture, I love it. It's out of the message Bible, but it's found in Romans chapter 10 and verse 11 through 13. It's in your notes, but listen. It says this, no one who trusts God like this, heart and soul, will ever regret it. It's exactly the same. No matter what a person's religious background may be, the same God for all of us, acting the same incredibly generous way to everyone who calls out for help. Everyone who calls, God help, gets help. In other words, God's saying, listen, Today, anyone here, when you come to God and believe that he is who he said he is and that he will do what he's promised to do when you reach out to him, God is faithful. He's on, it's unconditional. He has no favorites. It works for whosoever. Anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord is saved. God abundantly shows his grace because why? It's unconditional. It's that way for everyone. You know, a man called me this week and he was telling me his testimony. He was like, you know, Pastor Ken, in light of the series that you've been sharing, I gotta tell you this. And he told me, you know, years ago, before he'd come to the church, before he'd known Jesus, he was making a lot of money. He said, but you know what? My life wasn't blessed in the least. I had a lot of money, but I was constantly problems, stress, turmoil, difficulties, you name it. He said, you know, I came to Vertical Church a number of years ago, probably about five years ago now. And he said, you know, when I came here, God began to move in my life. I began to understand it. He said, but I heard you say something. Because I'd always been suspect before, okay? The churches wanted money. He said, I'd always listen. He said, you gave a challenge and you said this. And I had been teaching back then and I said this. Take God at his word, okay? I was talking about the, t- the subject of tithing. And God says, prove me now here what saith the Lord. And I gave this challenge. And it's the same today. Take God at his word for six months. Just do what he said for six months, and if your life is not better in six months than it is today, then you can come back and tell me all this is wrong, all this is, and I will never hold you responsible. In fact, you can tell God, I don't believe that aspect of it, and you'd be free from that end, because God's the one that put the challenge out, it ain't on me. But I said that, and that man said, you know what? I'm gonna prove him wrong. He went into that, I said, I'm gonna take that challenge, and I'm gonna show him that, because you know, he had that suspect point. And so about three months into it, he goes, my conditions really hadn't changed that much. He said, but my wife, and it's thank God to have a good wife. His wife said to him, listen, you're doing this for the wrong reason. You're trying to prove him wrong. So why don't you actually get into the Bible like he encouraged you and find out what God says and be honest about it. Because he says, even, this is what she said to him, even if you think you won in the end because your condition's not better, you cheated because you didn't do it right. You got to give it a full hard effort. So she said, you know what? I determined, all right, I'm gonna get in the Bible for myself. And he said, I began to do it. Now, three months already into it. He said, six months to the date that you gave that challenge. He said, not only had my wife and I now closed on a house that we didn't think we'd ever be able to have. He said, we had money in the bank abundantly. I had no idea where all this came from. That thing after thing after thing, so many things started happening. I'm going, you have to be kidding. And he shared with me, he says, you know, I don't make anywhere near what I used to make. He said, but now I give away large parts of my income. I have a beautiful marriage. I have so much God's doing on my life. I said, dude, you're describing what I've been talking about. That's the blessed life. See, God is moving. And he said, I have more joy, more peace, more security today than I ever. And the more we are generous, the more God comes up and shows up in ways that we couldn't even figure out what he was going to do. That's the point. It's unconditional. It works for whosoever. You just got to believe. You just got to trust that God is who he said he is. So it's what? It's free. It's unconditional. Lastly, listen, it's rich. In other words, it's more than enough. Because when you begin to recognize God is so faithful, that God doesn't just give you enough. God gives you more than enough. Why? Because this is what he said regarding his blessing. Here's what the blessed life looked like. We start with this scripture when we began. God is able to provide all grace to abound to you that you always, having all sufficiency, in all things, abound to every good work. In other words, see, Abraham discovered this about God. He discovered a name about God that nobody knew before. It was El Shaddai. Now, I know none of you are Hebrew scholars, but let me tell you real simply, El Shaddai means this, the God who's more than enough. You discover when you follow God, when you allow God to intersect. See, because I said in the beginning, 
It's an invitation from God to do what? To experience life as he lives it. But it's also, at the same time, our invitation to God to get involved in all the areas of our life. And when you, when you allow God to get involved in all the areas of your life, you know what you'll find out? God's not enough, he's too much. God is more than enough. He is rich. And Jesus, through his poverty, came to make us rich. That means to be fully supplied. See, we have all these dear ideas about what rich means in our culture, but to people who are rich in our culture, to them generally it means greed, holding on to everything you have. God says rich life is one that's so well supplied that not only does God meet all your needs, but he gives you the ability to be the one that can meet the needs of others. And that is the richest existence there is on the earth. There's nothing more blessed. That's why Jesus said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And God has invited us. And when we take God up at that challenge, when we begin to live a generous lifestyle, we discover God is the source of our generosity. God's generosity to us is free. It's unconditional. And it's always more than enough because God is rich. And when God, when we trust in him, God is more than able to meet whatever need we have, but to such a degree, God is able to not only bring his blessing to us, but he wants to bring it through us because God is abundant in everything. He's always been and always remains. So now, think with me for a moment. As we close, today, think with me for just a moment today. What would your life look like if you actually had the courage to begin to live a generous life? What happens if you would deal with your fears and deal with the whole idea about God, are you trustworthy? Just think about what I'm sharing today. Look at the birds, look at life, look at all that God has done. Is he big enough to meet your needs? Is God really who he said he is? And will he do what he said he will do? Is God, here's the question, is he trustworthy? But imagine if you began to live a life of generosity, the blessed life, what God might be able to do in and through you. It just might blow your mind. What God would give you the opportunity to experience. What God would give you the opportunity to be able to partake of. So the question is this. What's keeping you from living the blessed life? God has made the invitation. It's available to all. And guys, you know what? We're gonna come into the most generous season of the whole year. Do you know last year at Christmas time in America, okay, just in America alone, we spent on Christmas gifts as a nation $600 billion. In America, we spent $600 billion on Christmas. Now listen for a moment. Do you know that the, the number one need in the underdeveloped nations of the world is clean water? It's responsible for more sickness, problems, you know, starvation, disease, you name it, the number one problem that humanity deals with in undeveloped nations is, un, is clean water. Do you know what it costs to solve the, un, the clean water problem in our world? $10 billion. We spent $600 billion on Christmas. You know, every year at Vertical Church, we do a first gift of Christmas. We have an opportunity, but this year we're gonna target it. Which what we're calling it this year is expanding our reach. We're gonna give everybody the opportunity to pray for themselves because here's what my concern is. We want you all to love your family. We want you to, 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 to show love and express generosity to your family. But think about this for a moment. We were talking about it as executive staff. How many even remembered what they got for Christmas last year? You know, we give gifts that are worn out, thrown away, all the rest of this stuff. But you know what? We wanna remember this about Christmas because somehow it's lost its meaning to so many. Because it all began with God giving us exactly what every one of us needed. And that God will provide the opportunity this year for us to collectively give something that will matter for eternity. Because in our campaign this year, we're gonna, we're gonna look at doing a few things. We're gonna reach out to our community more. We're gonna expand. One of the things we wanna do, the experience here, because people are being affected here at Vertical Church, we're gonna expand our concourse. You know what a problem is when people leave? We want the experience that people have when they come here to be second to none. We wanna provide opportunities for people to interact and all, all of that, all the things that go on. Vertical church would never exist without the generosity of God's people. So this Christmas, when we come together, 
Think about what impact we could have for eternity. If we just allow a part of what we do at this season to think about Jesus and do that.